One of the, I, I've tried to group these in some of the more common questions that we're getting. So the first, one of the first ones that is a relatively easy one, is the data from the SPRC aggregate of all the membership or do individual members input their own data? The way the assessment tool is structured is that individual SPRC members input their own data. It's not an aggregate entry. See, that was easy. <laughs> um, the other question then, Rick, this is probably more for you. How long to complete the assessment for the pastor, for the district superintendent, and for an SPRC member? We're, so the length, how much effort is required, we're, we're right in the process of figuring that out. But the estimates are, uh, that are our best guess right now is that a pastor would take uh, 45 minutes to an hour to fill out the survey. Uh, depending upon the technological savvy of an SPPRC member, uh, it might be slightly longer, but they're basically filling out the same survey as well. So each member uh, would take roughly an hour. The district superintendent uh, has to do less on each individual survey, but has to do many, many surveys. And so what we've done is made the uh, district superintendent survey, if they have the apportionment data in front of them, if they have attendance data available, if they're ready to sit down and do it, um, you're probably looking at about five to 10 minutes per pastor, uh, but then you're looking at 60 pastors or more. So it's, it's a substantial investment of time there. Uh, six to eight hours on the part of a district superintendent, but hopefully this can be rolled into the normal supervisory role of the position as we roll this out. So in the pilot study, five to 10 minutes per DS, only for five uh, pastors, uh, an hour for each of the SVPRC members. Uh, if that becomes onerous, I think we'll take steps to make it shorter. Uh, hopefully uh, we've timed it right and uh, we can we can get it going. But that's basically at an hour and then about 10 minutes on the part of the district superintendent. And if you have thoughts on what it should be, I'm very open to that. Okay, another question comes around racial ethnic diversity and what if any of the statistical data found in, are in ethnic congregations with et ethnic pastors, areas of bias identified and are there allowances for cultural context built into the tool? Uh, we were very, very careful throughout this entire process to get as diverse a sample as possible at all steps. So uh, we have as much diversity in our samples as there is in the church. You can take that for whatever it's worth. Um, but but it, we, we, we have diversity to the extent that it exists in the church. We have a representative sample of the church at all of the focus groups and at all of the survey levels. Um, there's not tremendous diversity, uh, but, but we, we have it where we could find it. Now, as for cultural context, I think Gwen probably is better situated to answer that question. The covenant making process is an opportunity for pastors, staff parish committees, and district superintendents to work together at the beginning in order to create um, good communication and to build into the covenant-making process uh, learning for the, the local church and um, opportunity to, for pastor and parish, staff parish committees to talk about how um, diverse cultural backgrounds um, bring different gifts and also present challenges that uh, should be addressed up front. So it keeps the covenant partners accountable to paying attention to uh, the dynamics in a cross-racial, cross-cultural appointment. And when a covenant is established at the beginning with those things in mind, and goals around how those partners are going to work together, there's a much better possibility for understanding, learning, and celebration of the diversity rather than at the end of um, some unattended process in which people are disappointed and what could have been a really wonderful relationship and ministry together 
turns bad because people haven't cared for those parts. So that's why the covenant making aspect of this from the beginning is so important. It just occurred to me to add one more thing about diversity. We took diversity very seriously in, as I said, every step of the process. We also, though, analyzed all of our results uh, separately by uh, demographic variables, also by church size. And very, very few differences emerged from that analysis with respect to the ranking of the KSAPs, the endorsement of the task clusters. Uh, there, there, there wasn't much difference. Uh, there, and, and some of the samples were relatively small, so they wouldn't reach statistically significant differences. But even just looking at the numbers, ignoring statistical significance issues, uh, the numbers, the means weren't different across racial groups. So there was, by and large, substantial agreement um, even across age groups, across gender, across racial, ethnicity variables, with respect to the rank orderings and the endorsement of the KSAPs and the task clusters. So uh, my, it is very interesting. Uh, I expected to see more diversity with respect to the rankings, uh, uh, and, and even whether some of these things might be more or less uh, relevant, and, and in the data they were not. Uh, if you have ideas on something that we may be missed in that, I'd be very interested in hearing those ideas. How will this tool work for, particularly for district superintendents who don't have a, who may not have the opportunity to have a detailed understanding of a pastor's job, how can you verify the reliability of the data? One of the, that's a great question. Uh, I think there's two issues. One of the questions, I think a very, very important question that we ask of district superintendents is how familiar, familiar are you with this uh, pastor's work? And for the cases, and, and, I, and I, it's hard for me to show uh, on the small graphics that I have here, but the familiarity rating is used to put essentially a confidence interval around the ratings of that pastor. And so if the pastor is not familiar with the, uh, I'm sorry, if the DS is not familiar with the pastor's work, then what you have in a sense is a lack of confidence in that DS's ratings for that particular pastor. And so we try to incorporate that familiarity rating into a representation of how, um, how well you know the pastor. But the second component is we hope that that statement of I'm not very familiar with this pastor's work and here I am rating that pastor should initiate conversations and inc hopefully encourage uh, interactions to increase familiarity, go visit the church. So I think we're incorporating in two ways. One, we're saying uh, don't weight heavily DS's ratings when they say they're not familiar with that pastor's work. But two, if you say you're not familiar with that pastor's work, remedy the situation. Let me just add that um, that you, whoever wrote that question has pointed to a serious concern that um, knowing pastors and knowing local churches is really foundational to a process of ministry assessment and evaluation that has some integrity. So um, it's part of then what needs to be done in terms of assessing the effectiveness of the district superintendent. Um, and every district superintendent needs to be undergoing a similar process of evaluation for his or her ministry. Uh, this question is, what is a process for evaluating the congregational goals, mission, and accomplishments, and how are they tied together? Well, they are intimately tied together because in a covenant relationship, all the parties have, a commi have commitments um, for which they need to be held accountable. And somebody mentioned it earlier that all of this cannot be placed on clergy. Um, there's a great deal of in our, our some assumptions that I think are reflected in some of the conversations around ministry effectiveness that imply that um, the 
problem is being posited on clergy and uh, on pastors of local churches. Uh, we all have to take responsibility, but part of the responsibility is that of the local church. And so in a covenant making process, the congregation um, and by way of the staff parish relations committee um, will make commitments to which they also will be held accountable and there is a process in the uh, or an appendix in the back of watching over one another in love which uh, staff parish relations committees will use to evaluate their performance and they need to be in communication with, um, they, they cannot in isolation set goals for, um, for the pastor and for their ministry without being, uh, setting that larger context. So that's why in the steps of, an evalu of a covenant process, it begins with knowing the context. The context is the community, it is the local church, and um, it's unique and specific uh, and for different ministry settings. So um, the congregation also needs to be in, engaged in this process of um, self-evaluation and the ministry assessment process that's outlined in uh, watching, over another, watching over one another in love uh, does include um, an evaluation of the congregation. This is a multifaceted question. A lot of um, questions raised around how this applies to deacons and elders who are serving an extension ministry. How does this apply to associate pastors serving at a church and what would the senior pastor's input be on the associate pastor's evaluation? How does this apply if um, a deacon is working inside the in, in a, within a congregation or a point beyond the local church, is this only for elders or can local pastors participate? So all the different status and jobs and appointment settings that clergy in our denomination hold, how does this apply in those areas? Well, um, I can start. Let me start on that. Um, again, the process that's outlined in watching over one another in love is written from the perspective of staff parish pastor and district superintendent being the covenant partners it was only written in that way because you can't talk about ministry assessment and evaluation in a sort of generalized way it needs to be written with specific partners in mind. So for the ease of describing the process, it was written for that context. The process of covenant making is appropriate for any ministry setting. And so at the end of the, the book, um, I asked the question, how can this same process be used uh, with district committees, with district superintendents and bishops being the covenant partners? How can it be used in boards of ordained ministry? How will it be used with staff? Um, so it's adaptable and you just can't write the process in sort of a hypothetical general way. So it is written around those covenant partners, but a covenant making and covenant keeping can be adapted for any um, persons and should be used in a whole variety of settings. In terms of the online aspect of it, um, I'll let Rick respond to that. So this is a, a really interesting and challenging question. Um, I, I've thought about it and then shelved it multiple times. Uh, <laughs> And, and said, okay, let me focus on the current pilot, which doesn't have these issues. Um, but ultimately, we're gonna have to grapple with this issue. We're gonna have to, for this process, how are we going to evaluate the relative contributions, for instance, in large churches, um, where you have multiple people responsible for different forms of ministry in the church? And I've had a number of people already come up and talk to me about this very issue in the one-on-ones uh, during the break. 
So this issue, I think, is a critically important issue. It, um, I think the process is adaptable, but I think we need to provide some guidelines on how to adapt it. What should it look like in, in these settings? And so uh, I'll, I'll take this to heart, and we'll sit down, and we'll think very hard about this issue. We'll solicit some more feedback on this issue. And in the, uh, uh, the responses uh, that we're going to we'll put more together in a more formal way to this question, this is a very important question, um, we'll try to provide s some direction, and I would encourage you, if you're in one of those situations or you're very familiar with those types of situations, to respond with feedback to me and, and, the, and, the, and the rest of us so that we can think more carefully about how to tailor the system, uh, customize the system, make it flexible enough to handle this situation. It's a, it's, a, it's a great need to generalize the system to cover these issues, and I don't have an easy answer, but I will work very hard on it now that I see how important the issue is. Related to that, questions have been asked about how you evaluate those for provisional membership or those coming into full membership with this tool, because selection and evaluation are different. What we can say is that we made an intentional decision to start with the clergy effectiveness tool because we need this now. The next phase of this process will be looking at the feasibility of a tool for provisional or full membership. We have not started having those conversations yet, but it's on the radar. And even within the, the, the advisory committee on candidacy and clergy assessment, we've talked about how do you take components of this tool to the certified candidacy level so that all along the way, those we are assessing and those who are serving in the church begin to fall into a, a similar selection and assessment process. Another question is how much will this cost and how do we sign up? There will be a cost for using this. I don't know what it is. It will be dependent on the cost for production of the system and upkeep of the system. You know, GBHEM is not in this to make money, and we do have apportionment dollars that can support some of this ministry. However, because of the nature of the church at this time with budgeting and other issues facing us, there will be a cost to annual conferences. I can say we'll keep that as, as reasonable as possible. How do you sign up? How do you, how do you sign up? Send us an email. <laughs> Send us an email. Um, you want to talk some to the pilot and roll out and some of that? So I, let me talk a little bit about sign up. And I don't want to, uh, obviously, I, I can't commit GBHEM to something uh, at this point. Um, and I also want to talk a little bit about this notion of selection instruments and decision instruments at the ordination process. And this is one of the, and I'll come back to sign up in just a moment. Uh, one of the, the key issues in getting an effectiveness instrument is once you have an effectiveness instrument, you can engage in what we would call validation work. You can identify predictors ahead of time that are related to uh, effective min, uh, uh, pastors who are performing effectively in their positions. So there are a number of different validation research method approaches that can say take a sample of uh, ministers or effective ministers, effective pastors, and see what instruments you can use uh, to predict their effectiveness. How do they differ? And so in a typical setting, in a typical uh, selection setting in an organization, you first have an, a measure of performance and then you use that measure of performance as the criterion to evaluate the quality of the decisions you're making in selection decisions. So this is the first step, and then you roll that into selection decisions. And that's very much, uh, in fact, this morning when I was talking with Meg, I alluded the, to the need to start thinking and moving in those directions. And that's, that's the very the next natural step to move in. Um, sign up and roll out. Right now, we are engaged. We just started two days ago with five conferences, uh, five uh, pastors in each of the districts in five conferences to make it to the next, uh, take us to the next level in terms of evaluating the instrument, its feasibility, its usability, its usefulness, its effectiveness. Thank you. Sorry. And, ah, there we go. And, and so right now, we're just in the final stages 
of evaluating the instrument. The idea is to have this evaluation done and a final report with modifications done by February, late February. And then at that stage, uh, the, the notion would be to roll it out. And so I think we're looking at uh, late summer to early fall for a full rollout. And if I would encourage you to contact one of us or all of us if you want to maybe get us involved in that process and prepping your conference or your district uh, for use of this instrument in late summer, early fall. Uh, there's a lot of work that can be done, a lot of conversations that can be had to get everyone on board and ready and know what's coming before the actual instrument happens. I think it would be a terrible mistake to just hit everybody with the instrument and say, go do this. I don't think it would work. So we can use this time between the final evaluation of this instrument that's due in February and the, and the real rollout of this instrument mid, late summer, early fall, to prep the participants. And so I think we can use this time very productively. And all I would say is get in touch with myself or Meg at GBHEM and let us know you're interested. And once we get you on a list, you'll probably get plenty of e emails from us and contact from us to, to, to keep you on board and keep you informed and updated. So, you know, I would be thrilled, absolutely thrilled, if we got ah, 20 conferences this full, first round. Maybe that's even unrealistic. I don't know. But if we got 20 conferences this year in the fall, think about where that could go. Um, if we got 15, we could go amazing places. And we've already got five. So the thing, imagine, you, we've got great representation here. If you could go back, if you're interested, and start priming the pump, let people know that this is there. Have them contact us. I would love to come visit. Let me come visit you and talk to you about this process so that when the fall comes, or late summer, we're ready to roll. And we have, if we got 20, 25 conferences, the next year you're almost guaranteed, well, the, we'll get some inertia. And with the, with the momentum, we could really go some great places. So just let me know. Let us know. And we'll, we'll go. That leads to a couple of questions we had about which of the annual conferences are participating in the pilot project and has this been before the Council of Bishops or have bishops been involved in the conversation? We do have annual conferences participating from each jurisdiction. From the western jurisdiction, Pacific Northwest is a part of the project. From South Central Jurisdiction, Southwest Texas Annual Conference is participating. From North Central Jurisdiction is, what is that? Are you able to say that yet? I don't think so. Okay. Okay, we're, we are wor working with a delegation from West Michigan to confirm that. So um, then from Southeast Jurisdiction, Florida is participating and then Northeast is Upper New York. Those bishops have been involved in this process. They invited us, or they invited their district superintendents and clergy to participate. We have not formally been before the Council of Bishops. I would like to be able to have that conversation with them, and we are working on that as we roll out the implementation of this program. This is why the microphone is never in the right place for Rick. This um, question has two parts. How does this instrument integrate or evaluate the dynamics of a pastoral leader's value as an agent for necessary substantive change in a particular context? In other words, how does this tool measure what the pastoral leader needs to do, what the church needs, but may not like or want in their leader? It's a great question, and the, um, the covenant doesn't guarantee success. A covenant can be created in such a way that it aims way too low. So what, what a covenant consists of must include the parts of the, the life of the community and the context of ministry that will challenge um, 
the congregation and everyone involved in this covenant to grow and to respond to the mission in that particular context. So um, it's very important that, that there be input in and agreements around how the church is going to grow and be engaged in mission. So you can't have a covenant that aims too low. Well, how can you guarantee that that doesn't happen? I think it is the various partners that contribute to the, um, to the covenant. In, in some annual conferences, like New England, the cabinet will provide input to, uh, or a, a list of, um, at the time of the appointment, the, the lay leader and the pastor being appointed receive a letter from the cabinet that outlines some of the expectations for that pastor and that lay leader in that appointment. So there is some way of um, saying, here's what we see from this angle. Uh, then the congregation, again, beginning with a, um, a contextual analysis of their local church and their community needs to set some goals for itself. So what goes into the covenant is critical. And if you aim too low, then the kinds of things that this person is asking about won't happen. But um, I think it's very possible that um, through this covenant making process in which people are open and um, committing to something significant, uh, you can avoid that. I, I would just like to, to reiterate, reemphasize my agreement with those points that Gwyn just made. I think that this issue is a really important one in the ultimate implementation and effectiveness of the system. And in any kind of bureaucratic mechanism, system, there's always ways to game it. There's always, you, you know, event, you, you know that the instrument will be used potentially against you. Um, it may not be in your best interest to, be, to set a really great covenant or a really hard set of goals. And people are smart. Pastors are pretty smart folks. Um, they've also been exposed to a lot of bureaucratic stuff. <laughs> and, 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 and they're pretty savvy. I think they're actually very savvy about ignoring a lot of uh, poor stuff. Um, <laughs> And so I think two, I have two goals here. One is to show through words, but more importantly, actions and deeds, that this instrument can actually make a difference. If you use it right, if you fully engage it, you can improve your effectiveness and the congregation will be better off as a result. It works. That will just come with demonstrations over time. We've made the hurdle for entry as low as possible. If I were in a Fortune 100 or Fortune 500 company, we, I would just say, here's your system, and they would say, you do this. That is not really the structure of how the United, the autonomy the, the, is in the United, that, that would not work, I think, very effectively. So we can't be in a system in the United Methodist Church where I just get you know, somebody, Council of Bishops, I suppose, to say, do this. It, it will probably get done for a while. I have, but it ha there has to be this bottom up. There has to be interest. There has to be belief. There has to be commitment in doing it the right way. And that's one of the reasons that I think it's so important to be in front of groups like this and getting you to talk about um, what this could be to your pastors. The, the other thing is we've made the, the, the entry hurdle pretty low for DSs. The hope, and, and I understand how overwhelmed everyone is by the administrative functions of these roles, but if we can make it smaller and more coherent, more compact and more focused, we can get rid of a lot of the stuff on the side and allow more focus on this stuff 
uh, this stuff, that's interesting, um, related to this process. And then my hope would be that district superintendents would want to be more involved, not just saying supporting, but actually guiding covenants, actually influencing, is this an appropriate, is this really a stretch covenant for this congregation? Yes or no? Bishops could get involved with this. So I, I can see this system being modified. I want the, the hurdle for entry to be relatively painless. But my hope is as it's engaged, as it's seen to be valuable, as, it's, as the value of it is more widely recognized, people would want to become more involved in it. And we can modify the system so that the covenant actually has uh, more teeth when it needs to have more teeth from uh, potentially district superintendents. Other pastors could review each other's covenants the congregate and, and make, so there's lots of different ways that these covenants can be made and kept honest and real. Um, but I think, I think it only can happen if there's trust. There has to be trust in the system that it works, that it, it's doing its job, that it's not being misused. And so building that trust and showing how it can be done is really a core goal in, in, these, initial, in these initial phases. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful question. A couple of questions on the uh, BOM training hashtag right now. One is, as the church changes dramatically over the next 10 years, how will the ranking of task clusters in the KSAPS tool be adjusted? Covenants are living I don't even want to call it a document. They're, they're, uh, they're alive. They're dynamic. And they need to be reviewed continually based on all kinds of changes. Sometimes they'll be reviewed and changed within uh, a few months if there's something that happens in a community or happens uh, in a local church that necessitates reassessing where you are and what needs to be done, and all the partners rethinking what is it we need to be committed to now. So a covenant needs to be alive. It can't be put in place in cement and then put on a shelf. It, it is a continual um, conversation that has to go on and adjustments have to be made along the way. Now, uh, in terms of specific knowledge and um, abilities, personality characteristics, um, perhaps those change as well, and I'll let Rick address that. But always keeping in mind that this is a living um, document and it has to be, um, it has to be reviewed and changed as people change as context change. So um, it would definitely not be cemented. <laughs> so the, the changes in the KSAPs, uh, changes in task clusters, um, how will that be incorporated into the system? Uh, many, many response. I thought about this a great deal, and many responses to this. Um, on one of my first responses is, I think that many things are likely to change in uh, the way worship maybe is done, the way music is done, alternative worship styles, maybe alternative structures of uh, the United Methodist Church itself. That's already been tried. Um, but I'm not sure that the fundamentals of Wesleyan doctrine, I'm not sure the, the fundamentals of God are going to change. And so uh, I, I question, I wonder, I'm skeptical, that there will be large changes uh, in the next 10 or 15 years in the KSAPs, the task clusters, and their relative rank orderings. One of the things that I've learned in the past 15 years is the church does not like to change very quickly. Um, <laughs> I, 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 
and, and, and so I'm not, I'm not convinced that there's going to be meaningful change over time, but I think it will be important to stay on top of that and assess it repeatedly over time, maybe every two or maybe every four years, to re-engage in a survey of the importance. The survey is already there. Doing it again is not a big problem. So re-engaging in evaluating whether these are the right KSAPs, whether these task clusters still hold, and uh, what are their relative ranks. That would be easy research to do. Very, very, uh, the, the methodologies are all in place. The instruments are all in place. That could just be run up the, the flagpole and done in, in, in four to six months on maybe a four-year basis, and I think that, that that's worthwhile. I think it would be important to see if these things are stable or not. Um, I, I, I'm not sure they're going to change uh, very much, although I think a lot about how uh, the job is done may change. I'm not sure the fundamental task clusters, uh, preaching, teaching, helping, are going to change that much. Those have been around for an awful long time. I expect them to be around for an awful long time. Um, but if they do change, we have the methodology to track that, and there is firm commitment to make sure that this is a living process, that it's an adaptable process. And if we find something that's not working, to absolutely go in and fix it. Um, I have a, 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 a question uh, related to this question, and the, the, the question is, uh, and I'm going to punt on most, mostly everything here, but the question is, please define trust in God and why it is an ability. Um, you see why I want to punt on that immediately. Uh, I, I don't recall the definition of trust in God that we uh, arrived at after lengthy, lengthy conversations. It is in the final report, and it is in all of the technical report documents, and I will post it in response to this question uh, within the next week. But again, this is a living document, and it, if we want, as a group, to change the way we're conceptualizing trust in God, we can do that. Now, why is it an ability? Because you told me it was. Uh, the groups I interviewed were pretty adamant that you have it or you don't have it. That you, this is not something that you develop over time. And we had this conversation extensively because I, I really don't understand, you know, this is not a normal uh, content area for me. And so I really wanted to make sure that we were exploring this in all of its complexities. And time and time again, it came back, no, you have it or you don't have it. This is not something you mold. This is not something you develop. You have it. And so it was pretty clear in these focus group interviews and in the surveys that this was a, conceived of as a relatively stable aspect of a person, a pastor. Again, though, if we need to, if, if the data show that trust in God changes over time, if we collect this data and we have it over time in longitudinal ways and we find that trust in God is increasing or decreasing over time, well, we have clear evidence that it's not stable. We have clear evidence that it's developable and then we need to change the way we're conceptualizing trust in God and measuring trust in God and representing it in the system. So the system in some sense will help us, will tell us some of these things as we use it. And as we use it and we get date more and more data from it, we'll use it to inform making it a better system. So in a sense, I'm punting on three different levels there. Um, <laughs> I'll stop. I just want to say a brief word about the case apps and how they might change. I don't think this is a contradiction of what Rick said, but just um, in terms of knowledge or in terms of um, skills and abilities, I do think that um, moving forward, we cannot ignore the need for ability or knowledge around cultural differences. Um, we need skills and cultural sensitivity. We live in an interfaith um, context, and so we need you know, maybe when I started in ministry, um, if you took world religions in seminary, it was enough to see you through. Uh, I don't think so now. Um, so in terms of 
the particulars around knowledge. You know, the, the, the more general thing about knowledge, skills, abilities, and personality characteristics, um, I think there are some essentials that will not change. But we are living in a different world uh, from when I was ordained, and um, so all of that has to be taken into account, and we do need to learn. We need to be lifelong learners and um, constantly engaged with our context. So in that sense, I, I would say that um, the skills and the knowledge that we need to have to be in um, ministry in effective ways um, is changing. But again, covenant making enables us to um, account for those changes and to covenant with one another around learning and growing so that uh, we are better equipped to meet those changes. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Gwen. We have many, many other questions over here, so thank you.